Hi everyone, this is Caroline with Fiveable, and you are tuning in to tonight's um, podcast. So we're going to wrap up ecology. Um, I apologize if you were expecting to tune in last week. Um, I very last minute had to take my dog to the emergency vet, um, which was not great. We were there for five and a half hours um, and it happened like right before we were supposed to go live. So we were there past midnight, which sucked. But we're back. So I do want to wrap up ecology just because the last time we were here, that's what we were talking about. Um, but then we also need to jump into review. It is review season. Review is upon us. Um, whether you like it or not, um, the AP exam is very quickly approaching. Um, and if we account for spring break, which I'm sure you guys all have coming up the week after next, which is very exciting. We have one, two, three, four weeks, that's it, left of school classes um, before the AP exam. So the time is now. Um, we'll have a lot of cram sessions right before the exam. Um, what was I, ooh, gosh, what was it? Oh, for Fiveable Plus members. So definitely uh, sign up for Fiveable Plus if you haven't already. Um, and uh, let's get started because we have lots to talk about. So I know I've said this before. I'll probably say this a million more times if you continue to come to my review sessions. But the more questions you ask, the easier this is for all of us. So I will be frequently flipping back and forth to make sure that I can get any of your questions answered should you have them. Even if it's not directly related, um, now is the time to get your questions answered, right? Four weeks out. Um, so I'm more than happy to answer anything uh, for you. All right. Nope, that didn't work. Like technology is, is truly my worst enemy. I feel like every time that I'm on this, something happens. All right, here we go. I'm off my game since I missed last week. Okay, so human impact. Again, this is where we left off um, if you were joining us in for ecology. So it's really, really important to acknowledge some human impacts on the environment. Um, they have an absolutely brutal effect on the environment. Um, and also the AP exam knows that and knows that it is a current hot topic and will be for some time. Um, so it's definitely something that will show up as like a free response question potentially or uh, embedded into multiple choice questions. So I always try to touch on it with my students just so you're familiar with these things. Um, so some types of human impact, and then I'll dive into a few more specific examples of the most important ones. Um, climate change, sure you've heard of it. It is very much real. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Uh, it is having incredibly detrimental effects on our environment. Um, so that's a big one that I'll go into more detail about. Deforestation, habitat destruction and fragmentation. Agriculture is a huge, huge, huge contributor to all sorts of problems. Um, urbanization, monocrop monocropping infrastructure development, all of these things are going to have drastic effects on our environment. Okay, so climate change, let's talk about this a little bit. So I like this graphic because it shows this increase in carbon dioxide. And if you tuned in, I guess it was three weeks ago when we talked about nutrient cycles, um, we talked a lot about the carbon cycle and how uh, the carbon cycle works. So we release CO2, uh, plants use that CO2 and convert it into glucose and they produce oxygen, we use oxygen and produce CO2 from glucose, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is uh, we are emitting an extensive amount of carbon dioxide, way more than the plants that we have on Earth can convert back into glucose. And you can see the major things here. So agriculture is the big one. Cow farts. Cow farts are made of methane. Uh, and methane is a huge, huge, huge contributor to the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. Um, it's 9%, as we can see up here, of our greenhouse gases. Um, but agriculture is also contributing a lot to carbon dioxide, as is all of our different methods of transportation, um, industry, we're burning fossil fuels, all of these things are emitting um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Anytime we burn wood, we burn these fossil fuels, we burn coal, things like that. Uh, we are emitting a ton of this. With that, I think I have a graphic, here we go. We have all these greenhouse gases that are basically forming a barrier, like an extra layer to our ozone layer, O3 ozone layer, which protects us. It's a very nice layer that protects us from the majority of the sun's harmful rays. The problem is now that we have this thick layer of greenhouse gases, we're getting a bunch of these rays in. And while originally they were uh, most of the part, the 
leaving most of the part. So 54% was reaching the surface of the earth. In this case, with these thick greenhouse gases, they're actually getting trapped in here. That's why we call them greenhouse gases. If you've ever been to a greenhouse, even in the winter time, oftentimes it's pretty warm because the sun is reflecting in and then bouncing off of the glass and keeping all of the plants warm and temperate um, so that they're actually saving a lot of money on heating that space. So with this, a bunch of the rays of the sun are actually radiating back to earth. Um, and this is just an important concept to know about if you weren't already familiar with it. Obviously, super hot topic. You hear about it on the news all the time. But you do kind of need to know the scientific inner workings here with that thick buffer layer of greenhouse gases and then the radiation coming back down to the surface. All right, agriculture, I talked about this a little bit, but agriculture is a crazy, crazy, crazy contributor to um, the destruction of our planet. So 45% of the land is occupied by, by livestock. Um, so there's a lot of research that's done that if we used uh, a portion of this land or a large portion of this land that's being used to grow livestock and meat, uh, we could actually fill all of those areas with sustainable plants and things like that that could actually end up feeding many, many more people and could um, help contribute to the end of world hunger. 33% um, of land is devoted to livestock feed, right? So 45% is them, 33% is their food, right? So not food that we're eating, but food that the livestock are eating. 14.5% of global greenhouse gases are produced uh, by livestock. So that's gonna be that methane, those farts, things like that, flatulence, I should say, scientifically. And then 23% of our fresh water is being used to grow just the feed for the livestock. Okay, so not, not uh, food for us, but food for them, which, obviously we're getting energy from, but so their agriculture is, is, is a huge hit on the environment in a lot of different ways. In case you weren't familiar, that's another one that again is a hot topic and may show up on your exam. All right, so those are really the only ones. Um, you just do need to be familiar with them. Uh, it's really interesting to do some more research. I can post, um, I'll post my very favorite um, YouTube video, it's a spoken word called Dear Future Generations, if you're not familiar. It's, um, it's a real emotional uh, video, but it, it gives a lot of statistics and talks about how we're destroying our planet, which we are. Uh, but it's, it's a pretty interesting lesson. It's only like five minutes long. All right. So that was like tying a bow on ecology. And now we're going to push forward. We will review ecology again. Um, but my goal is, and if you tuned in two weeks ago, my goal for review is that we have enough time. I would rather spend less time in the beginning of the year, right? Like when I was talking to probably not you guys, maybe you guys in September, um, I would rather spend less time on evolution then so that I have more time now when the exam is super fresh and or when the exam is going to be, you know, coming up and this information will be a lot fresher in your brain. Um, I just feel like that's a more valuable use of our time. So again, exam or review is only as good as uh, how many questions you guys ask and how involved you want to be in it. Um, so if there's anything that I'm talking about that you're confused of, please um, ask the question. If there's words that I'm using, vocabulary, things like that, concepts that you're not sure of, please just let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll keep plowing through because there's a lot of evolution vocabulary to review. Um, but hopefully this this reignites some neurons in your brain uh, and helps to make some, some more specific connections for you. Um, and you can get the one-on-one -on -one help that you need if you need it. So this thing that we're preparing for, I'm sure you guys already know this. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, I heard a lot about it before from your teacher, but you need to know what, what you're up against, okay? So this is what it looks like. So the first section of your exam, um, which is happening at 8 a.m. in the morning in whatever time zone you're in on May 13th, Monday, May 13th, 8 a.m. on a Monday is always the AP bio exam. It's crazy that they do this to you, but they do. Um, so at 8 a.m. that Monday morning, you'll sit down. The first thing that you'll take is the multiple choice nine questions it's an hour and a half and it's 50 percent of your exam score so we get 50 percent from multiple choice 50 percent from free response each section is an hour and a half this one has 69 questions specifically if we break that down 63 of those questions are your typical um multiple choice the ones that you've seen for forever uh except you know they have like paragraphs long text which you're familiar with hopefully you've been practicing things like that um I can start to incorporate more practice with things like that because um, you need to know what you're actually up against and it's not like your basic multiple choice question that just wants to know if you know what a ribosome is. They ask it in the most obscure of obscure ways. Uh, and then the other six that make up that set of 69 are grid-in questions, which are just like the student-produced responses of the SAT. 
hopefully you've practiced some of those with your teachers as well. Um, but that's where you're gonna bubble in an actual number to a math question. So this is when I can start actually implementing or, or telling you guys a little bit about my strategies and what I tell my students when they're taking the test. So one thing that I always tell my students is that of those six grid in questions, three are probably really basic algebra, and then three might be really tricky. Um, it might be like a new equation that you've never seen before that they want you to apply, which is crazy. Um, maybe Hardy-Weinberg if you're really, really not confident in your Hardy-Weinberg abilities, um, but it may be um, something that's gonna be really challenging. What I always tell students to do, and this is the same with the SAT, is to take a look at those grid in questions first. But the bottom line is, it is a highly unlikely that every student will finish this test, right? And I don't know how fast you are at taking a test, but I know speaking for my students, probably three quarters of them will not finish the multiple choice section because it's just really, really long and really, really hard, and it's just a lot of reading. If you're a fast reader, you might be fine, but if not, you very well may not finish. So a grid in question, you have to literally bubble in a number, so you can't guess right? It's not like the end of the multiple choice when you can just like pick C and bubble it down to make sure you at least have an answer in every question. I always pick C, but you can pick whatever letter choice you want. You can't randomly bubble in a, a number. So what I tell them is to look at the grid ends, very first thing, and just quickly work through that or quickly look through them, all six, and determine which ones are the easy ones and which ones are the hard ones. Do not waste time on the hard ones because the five minutes you wasted on that is worth the same point as an easier multiple choice question that now you don't get to get to because you spent too much time on a grading question. But you wanna look for those basic algebra questions that are gonna be really, really quick and easy for you so that you have a chance to answer them. You get those free, easy points and then you can jump into the multiple choice, okay? So a lot of acing the AP exam is realizing that you need to skip questions sometimes. I always tell this to my students because AP Bio students are brainiacs, and they're usually stubborn brainiacs, which means they want to attack every single question. And the bottom line is, again, unless you're a really fast reader, you very well may not finish this exam. So if you're trying to attack a really challenging question just because you're an AP student and you're stubborn and you think that you need to get through every one, you're actually doing yourself a massive disservice. So skip it. Put a little dot. I always put like a little pencil dot on that question number on my bubble sheet my Scantron, um, so I know which questions I want to come back to. And, um, you know, if you have time at the end, then great. Now you get to tackle that long problem. Congratulations, right? But you don't want to waste an, an opportunity to answer some easier questions first. So those are my basic strategies for multiple choice. So you're going to want to go to your Grinnins first. You're going to want to look for the three easy algebra questions. It's usually three. It's not always three, but, you know, you're smart people. You can figure it out. Um, and then you're going to want to go back to your multiple choice and start working there. Questions about strategies for multiple choice. I'll continue to tell you guys this, but it's important to hear. All right, then section two is the free response. It's also an hour and a half. It's also 50% of the exam, and it's eight questions long. So there's two long free responses, which are each worth 10 points, and then six short free responses, three of which are worth four points, three of which are worth three points, and I can show you how to identify how many points everything is worth just by looking at the bolded words in the questions. So we can take a look at an example in the weeks to come to make sure you're familiar with that. Okay? Um, all right. And with this, my strategy is to always start with the short free response. So I always tell my kids to start with question eight and then move back to questions two and one, the long free response. The thing is, and I've talked to so many people who grade the AP exams and so many people who have taught the AP exam for like 40 years, and students will waste 45 minutes easily on a long free response writing pages because they give you like five pages for it. You never need to write five pages. You should never be writing five pages. You can usually get away with writing a page or less. Okay? So students will get super caught up in it and then they've wasted half their time and they'll get like two points out of 10 because it's really rigorous grading, okay? So my uh, my advice here is to always start with the shorter free response that are gonna take way less time, where you can get two points in five minutes as opposed to two points in 45 minutes, and then work your way towards those longer free response. Um, there's always gonna be things that you don't know. They're always gonna throw crazy scenarios at you. It's what they do, right? Don't feel like just your teacher didn't teach you that crazy scenario. That's not the case. No teacher taught that crazy scenario, okay? They're testing you on something that you do know, so you just have to be able to kind of work through that mumbo jumbo in order to get to the other side.
Any questions so far with strategies? This is just high level stuff. I'll keep going through it with you. Um, but it's important that you that you know how to attack this thing. Okay, great. Here we go then. Um, so I'm going to review a lot of different words now from evolution. So we're going to start at the very beginning. So if you weren't here with me back in September, um, this will be kind of like brand new fresh for you. Um, and hopefully you've heard all these words in class. And we can just kind of tidy up definitions. You can ask questions if you have them and then we'll move on. Okay. So when we're talking about evolution, we're going to start, so I'm going to start uh, small. We're going to talk uh, microevolution, I'm sorry, and then which is going to be evolution within a population of individuals within a population. And then we'll kind of extrapolate and go towards macroevolution. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll talk briefly about the origins of life. Okay, so natural selection uh, is, you know, commonly kind of nicknamed survival of the fittest, right? But you shouldn't write survival of the fittest on your AP exam because you can be a lot more specific here. So what natural selection truly means is that there are different advantages, right? Different adaptations, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, maybe I didn't put that slide in. So an adaptation is going to be something that is beneficial to an organism in its environment. Remember that an adaptation is not always an adaptation. It is dependent on the environment. Okay, so like a polar bear has some adaptations that make it incredibly well adapted to uh, the Arctic, but would not make them incredibly adapted to the city of Chicago. Okay, so just keep that in mind. But natural selection is going to be acting upon those adaptations that exist in a population already. Okay, you can see this here. We have a bird beak, and then we see we have uh, divergence, right, of lots of different birds. This would be uh, Darwin and the Galapagos finches, okay? And each one of these different birds has a different adaptation um, that is fitting for its environment, right? Whatever its environment is providing. And then that individual is more able to survive and reproduce than something that does not have that adaptation. And that's how we see natural selection occurring. So a couple things that you need to know, some rules that are kind of in place for natural selection in order for it to occur. So in order for it to occur, populations have to have an enormous potential to reproduce, right? If things are not reproducing or if we don't have a large population size, we're not going to see natural selection occur because uh, we, we don't have the ability to survive and reproduce. The reproduce part would not be present then. Um, the population size would need to remain stable. Resources need to be limited. Why? So that individuals need to compete for survival, right? If everyone has a fair chance of surviving, then we're not going to see natural selection occur because there's no advantage, right? You technically don't have an adaptation if there's not an advantage, right? So if any every individual is just like, hey, okay, then we're not going to see natural selection occur. There needs to be variation within a population. Variation is the key to life and the key to evolution everything is exactly the same, then one cannot be better than the other, right? So we need to have variation within the population. Variation needs to be inheritable, meaning we need to be able to pass it on to our offspring, otherwise we're not gonna see this happening. Um, only the most fit individuals survive, right? So those with the adaptation for the environment are gonna be the ones that survive. And uh, evolution occurs as favorable traits accumulate in a population. So as we see more and more of these favorable, favorable traits, right, this natural selection is going to be pushing towards um, evolving populations and things uh, going through potentially like speciation or something like that. Okay, questions about natural selection? Cool. Genetic variation is the key to this. And a grader once told me, if you're running out of time and you see an answer choice that has genetic variation in it, pick that answer choice because it is statistically usually the right one. So there's your, your example there of a helpful tip. All right. So with natural selection, we can have a couple different types. Um, they're not always typed like this, but sometimes they will uh, bring uh, an example like this to your attention. Um, and you've probably heard of all of these before, but we usually have in a population kind of a normal distribution of gradients of different traits, right? So in this example, we're looking at fur color in mice. And there's like a bell-shaped uh, gradient, right, where we have very few very light mice, very few very dark mice, and most are chilling in this middle phenotype realm. Um, with this, this is an easy population to have a couple different things happen, um, like that stabilizing directional and disruptive selection. So stabilizing is always going to push towards the middle phenotype. Um, so we're going to lose our extremes here. We're going to lose our dark brown. We're going to use our light, lose our lightest brown. Perhaps um, 
we have some sort of environment in which everything just kind of turns this neutral or we, we gain new predators that are more able to distinguish the very light and very dark fur type colors. And therefore we're going to have this push towards the middle. Um, but whatever it is, we're losing our extremes in these situations. In directional selection, we are, just as it sounds like, favoring one direction. So if the um, geographic location suddenly changes color, right, and gets darker, maybe uh, a volcano erupts somewhere off in the distance, and so the ground gets sooty and darker, um, our darker mice are going to have the selective advantage here. They have the adaptation as opposed to that middle ground. Um, and so we're going to push just in that one direction, and we're going to lose all of our lightest type of mice. And then lastly, disruptive selection is disruptive, right? You have your bell curve and you just disrupt the middle of it. And we favor both extremes in this example. Um, so, you know, if all of a sudden we have a new predator who is for some reason able to distinguish just the middle colored mice, or if we have that volcano erupt on one side and a, a nice snowfall on the other that favors both extremes here. Um, as you can tell, disruptive selection is gonna be kind of less common which is why I have ooh, such a hard time coming up with like a normal example for you. Um, but we're going to push towards those both extremes. Uh, when this would potentially happen is in a speciation event, right? Where something happens and our, our populations divide perhaps, and there's um, some sort of like bottleneck or founder effect. And we just have like our extreme phenotypes being represented more than anything else. Um, that could be um, an example of where we would see disruptive selection. Any questions so far? Cool. Please stop me if you have questions. Makes everything more interesting. All right. Another example uh, of natural selection in real life that you need to be familiar with. In fact, uh, and you can look at this. You can actually Google like the AP Biology Standards Manual if you want to see what your teachers are basing all these things off of. Um, this is given as an example of something that students should know. And it's the peppered moth examples outside of London during the Industrial Revolution. So Industrial Revolution, picture on the left, not a real picture, just a nice little artistic representation. When uh, industry blew up over in London, we have tons and tons of factories, no regulations on what they're emitting. And we have soot and dirt and grime flying through the air like you can't even imagine, like nothing we have today. Um, and it's going to lead to a phenotypic change in the moth population in the area. So on the bottom, you can see these white moths that are blending in really nicely with birch trees. So birch trees are a nice whitish tree um, that these white peppered moths blend in very nicely with. And as you can see, if you were further away from this tree, that moth would be very well blended in. Um, then what happens is, so these are the favored moths, right? Because they blend in very well, predators can't see them, they're surviving, they're reproducing all as well. Then all this pollution comes into play and these trees are absolutely covered in soot, right? They're absolutely covered in filth. Uh, and these moths start dying, right? Because they're easy to spot uh, and birds and their other predators are able to eat them quite easily, uh, which leads us to a directional selection event where we're favoring the darker phenotypes. So, what you need to know and what I'm going to like continually enhance, no moth turned colors, no moth turned colors, no moth turned colors. If you can't turn colors, then a moth can't turn colors. Okay. So what you have to know is that natural selection exists, acts on existing phenotypes. So these black moths must have been present in the population. Okay. And we just see them more and more prevalently because they're the ones that are able to survive and reproduce and the white ones are dying. So the white ones are dying, the black ones are the ones that are having the babies, so the black ones are the ones that we're seeing in the next generation. Important example to be familiar with, and really, really important that you know that natural selection only works on existing phenotypes and that you never use vague language, like the moths changed colors, or the moths turned black, or anything like that, because none of that is true. Okay. Speaking of variations, now we're going to go through and I'll give some examples of some sources of variation. We have various sources of variation uh, in a population. So mutation is a, is a big one. Uh, it's obviously random. Oftentimes it's harmful. Sometimes it's helpful. Um, usually it's more subtle than anything. It's not going to lead to anything too crazy. Um, but oftentimes that's how variation begins. And then if it's a desirable mutation, that mutation gets passed on to the offspring of that individual more readily than, oh, I'm sure. 
the normal individual, and it propagates. Sexual reproduction is a major source of variation. So back in the day, we talked about independent assortment, random fertilization, and crossing over, right? And all of those things, combining gametes from two different individuals is going to lead to a plethora of variation within a population. Diploidy, right? Being diploid organisms, having two versions of each trait means that we can pass on uh, a dominant or a recessive allele, especially if you're a heterozygote. And there are scenarios that we will talk about called the heterozygote advantage um, that kind of propagate these heterozygotes, which means that we're going to always have variation in our population because heterozygotes have both the dominant and the recessive allele. And then outbreeding, right? So not inbreeding, <laughs> outbreeding, uh, mixing who we are mating with uh, and making sure that you're not like mating within families or anything like that is going to lead to a great deal of variation as well. So let's talk a little bit more about some of these. All right, so heterozygote advantage. Let's go into that one because the rest are all pretty much um, straightforward. And we'll talk about uh, sexual reproduction a little bit more when we review um, like cell division and meiosis and mitosis. So today we'll focus mainly on heterozygote advantage. Okay. Um, this is something to be familiar with, and this is another one of those things where it says in my book of standards that I'm required to teach students that you should be familiar with the example of heterozygote advantage with sickle cell. Okay. So here's what you need to know. So sickle cell anemia is caused by a single point mutation uh, in a region of chromosome 9 that leads to a misfolding of a protein in our blood cells. And if you have this misfolding and if you have two copies of this deleterious mutation, then your blood cells look like sickles. So a sickle is like the thing on the top of the Grim Reaper, Reaper's staff. Uh, it's actually a farming tool. But Anyway, uh, that's what the name comes from in case you were wondering. And if you are homozygous recessive, then you have this sickle cell disease and these sickled blood cells um, can actually uh, kill you, right? Especially if you live in a country that doesn't have modernized medicine. So this is very common in places in Africa and I will tell you why in a second, um, but they can, can basically these um, cells do not move through our veins and arteries like our normal blood cells do, like they were meant to. And so they can actually get stuck together and it can lead to a lack of oxygen, it can lead to a stroke, all sorts of um, things. If you are heterozygous for this, then you have a mix of blood cells, the healthy round ones and the sickled ones. And if you are homozygous dominant for this, uh, then you have just, so I guess this is more of a co-dominant trait. I should probably not use um, that terminology here. But uh, if you are dominant, you have two dominant alleles, then you have all healthy red blood cells, okay? So where heterozygote advantage comes into play is that there are certain scenarios in which being a heterozygote is actually, actually beneficial. And what that means for a population is that population is always going to have genetic variation because heterozygotes have the dominant and the recessive allele. So how this plays out in Africa, where malaria and sickle cell are quite common, is this. Okay, so in Africa, uh, both of these diseases, malaria, which is carried by a mosquito, and sickle cell, which is a genetically inherited disorder, are very common and both can kill you. Um, usually malaria is relatively treatable, but just depends on how many times you get it, etc. So the bottom line is if you're living in Africa, if you're born in Africa and you have sickle cell disease, you are going to die for the most part because the uh, medicine over there is not going to be as readily accessible to you uh, and the disorder is going to be very hard for, to treat. So we are eliminating our homozygous recessive individuals. Our homozygous dominant individuals are gonna survive sometimes, but they also are susceptible to malaria. So malaria, I should have specified this earlier, infects red blood cells. So, um, what it does is the parasite actually enters into the red blood cells and it can make you really sick, lack of oxygen, all sorts of things like that that you don't want. So if you have healthy red blood cells, that's lovely, but you're very susceptible to this sickle cell disease, which can infect these cells. In the middle where the heterozygote advantage comes into play is that you have this mix of blood types. So you're actually um, resistant to malaria because the parasite cannot infect those sickled cells, uh, but you only have very mild sickle cell disease and you'll survive both. 
Okay. So we're going to see a lot more heterozygotes in the population because our homozygous dominant and our homozygous recessive individuals are dying from two different diseases. And therefore, we have this strong heterozygote middle group, uh, which means that unfortunately, sickle cell is going to continue to be a problem for a long while because, as you guys know from doing genetics, if you cross two heterozygous individuals together, 25% uh, of their offspring will be homozygous recessive and therefore will have sickle cell disorder. Cool. Need to be familiar with that example. Should be able to explain it. Any questions? All right. So, and we're zooming through, and this is not supposed to be like super con continuous. I was going to say continuous, which may also work. Can't be sure. Not an English teacher. Thank goodness. Um, but the way this is going to work is I'm just kind of rapid firing topics from evolution that I think are the most important for you to understand. So if you're like, where are we? It's just that we're reviewing everything, okay? And, and really important things uh, to come, okay? So up next, causes for changes in allele frequencies, okay? So, so far we've talked about natural selection and how it acts on populations that have uh, different variations. We've talked about how some of those variations arise. And now we're going to talk about once you have variation in a population, how can it change? How can our allele frequencies change between dominant and recessive and what traits we have, et cetera? There's five major ways that this is going to happen. Through natural selection, through mutations, through gene flow. Remember, gene flow is the movement of alleles and genes between populations. A great example is like how humans travel everywhere and move to different places. Like I'm from Philadelphia, but I live in Chicago and um, this is where I have my life. So my alleles, my gene pool is here. Um, and so I have created variation in the city of Chicago with my Philadelphian genes. Um, genetic drift, so the bottleneck effect and founder effect of which I'll go into detail both, and then non-random mating. So these are all the different ways that we can see change in a population. Um, so here are some examples of that. So here's bottleneck versus founder effect. These are both examples of genetic drift. So here's what you need to know about genetic drift. Genetic drift is a massive uh, decrease in population size, a massive decrease in population size that is going to massively decrease the genetic variation, right? So the smaller the population size, the less variation we have. I mean, you can think about it this way. If the world were to end, right, and there was only 10 people left and all 10 people uh, were, you know, stuck in a bunker and then those 10 people were supposed to repopulate the entire world, um, you can see pretty quickly that there's not going to be as many as much variation with 10 people as there is with 7 billion, right? So when we have these, these events, um, we lead to a very small population that has a lot less genetic variation in it, which means it's going to be more susceptible to disease and um, some other some other things. It's just, you know, we have strength in numbers, strength in our variation. So on the left-hand side here, this is so bottleneck and founder effect are both just examples of what I just explained, genetic drift. The only difference is how we get to the end goal. So in bottleneck effect, and the reason it's called that is because of this image on the left, um, we have some sort of mass catastrophe where only a few remain, like the end of the world and only 10 people remain in a bunker somewhere, or a massive fire that eliminates the majority of a population, or an earthquake, or any event that you can think of where almost all of the population is dying out and we only have a few chance survivors left. As you can see in this example, our population started much more diverse with yellow, red, green, and blue little individuals. But then through this chance event, we were only left with blue and yellow individuals left. And so those are gonna be the only ones that can survive and reproduce. And so our new population is only blue and yellow, even though our original population was much more diverse, okay? So this is a classic example of bottleneck that you can extrapolate and use uh, with lots of different populations. Okay, on the right-hand side, again, same end goal, different way of getting there. Uh, we have some sort of ancestor population and a small group break off. They're the founders. They're going to found a new area, um, just like the founders of any city or country, et cetera. So in this case, we have three butterflies that fly off to their own island. Just so happens that that chance small group just has dark brown and tan butterflies and no white butterflies. So now on this new island, we will only have dark brown and tan and white butterflies will only exist in the ancestral population. 
Okay, so same end result, just the existing population or the original population gets to survive in founder effect, right? We just have a small group leave as opposed to the majority of the population being killed. Right? Okay. Cool. All right, another key example that I want to share with you. So those are our, uh, those are examples of genetic drift. Another key example that I want to share with you that you need to be familiar with is antibiotic resistance. Okay, and antibiotic resistance is really common and it also may show up on your AP exam because it is a hot topic as well. And again, they love incorporating hot topics. It is also something that is on my list of things to teach, which is why I'm reviewing it with you to make sure you're familiar with it. So basically, our bacteria that infect us are becoming resistant. And the major reason for this is because we are overusing antibiotics or we're not finishing antibiotics once we get them. So if you've ever gotten like a 10 day dose of antibiotics, you've only taken the first seven days and then you feel really great. So you don't take the remaining three days. You are a problem because you are contributing to antibiotic resistance because the three days that you were supposed to take that left could have wiped out um, some very antibiotic resistant bacteria. So if you think about it, even if there's only a few left inside of you, the bacteria that could possibly be left after seven days of being doused with antibiotic chemicals are the ones that are relatively resistant to that antibiotic. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there anymore, okay? So those that remain, right, which is what's happening here, so we have this starting population, we douse them with a toxic chemical, all the ones that don't have very much resistant are killed off, and then seven days later, you feel better, but there's still these two left. If you had finished your antibiotics, they probably would have been killed, but you didn't right? And so these still remain in your body. And then you cough and you spread it to someone else. But the strain that they get is a strain of only those bacteria that were relatively resistant to that antibiotic. So now you can see in the final population, we have all very highly resistant bacteria that have infected a new individual who can now not be treated with the same antibiotics that you were treated with because the bacterial infection that they have is resistant to it. So that's a big one. It's also my ploy. Uh, between um, or for, to get you to make sure that you're not taking antibiotics for a cold. 90% of the time when you're sick, it's a virus, so don't do that, okay? Uh, and that you're finishing your antibiotics when you have them. It's a legitimate reason. Monica, great question. The difference between founder effect and gene flow. So they're gonna have the opposite end goal. Gene flow increases genetic variation because it's people moving into new loca locations or animals or whatever species moving into new locations and bringing their gene pool with them. Gene pool is just the fancy word for like all your genes uh, that you have, like kind of separated and disjointed from yourself. Um, so gene flow is gonna increase genetic variation because you're bringing new genes from a new gene pool into an area, okay? Founder effect is going to de decrease genetic variation because we have a small subset of the population, which is always going to be less diverse than the entire population as a whole, because it's impossible to have the same amount of variation with so few people. And they're moving to a new area and recolonizing it. Okay, so it'd be like the same thing as like 10 people get together and they're like, let's just start our own island and we're just gonna reproduce and we're just gonna have our own colony, right? Then those 10 people are gonna be much less diverse than uh, the area that they came from. And so that's gonna decrease our genetic variation. So in both places, people are moving. It just so happens that in one, you're moving into a new population, and in one, you're moving to your own population where you are the only genes left, uh, which makes it less variation. Okay, any other questions about microevolution before we go into macroevolution? And I'll probably save origins of life for next week because I don't think we're gonna have time to do it justice today. No other questions? Okay. All right, so what Addie, hey, and my dog is getting herself into trouble. She knows that I'm preoccupied. She's brilliant, way too smart for her own good. Hence why we had to take her to the emergency vet last week. Let's see what I'm watching. Anyway, so while microevolution is the movement of alleles just in single population, right? Uh, macroevolution is going to be very large scale uh, evolution, hence macro, which means large, where we're gonna see speciation and things like that occurring. Um, and we see new populations and uh, massive changes as opposed to just the movement of alleles, which is what we've been talking about up until this point, okay? All right, 
So the first thing that you need to know uh, when we talk about speciation, which is going to be the majority of our talk in macroevolution, is what, what biologists and AP biologists consider a species, right? So here's our definition of species. A species is a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed in nature and produce viable, fertile offspring. They do not breed successfully with other populations, okay? So if you are the same species as something else, that means you can get together and you can produce offspring that are viable, meaning living, and fertile, meaning capable of reproduction. If you get together and you're not capable of producing living and fertile offspring, then you are not the same species as that thing, okay? We're going to talk about examples of how that occurs. So the entire, the entire crux of this is that gene flow between populations holds the phenotype of a population together, right? So if genes are flowing amongst populations, then we're gonna to continue to be able to produce viable fertile offspring. So if speciation is going to occur, the gene flow between those populations needs to stop, right? Because if you're the same species as something and two new species are gonna form out of that, right? Uh, and you used to be able to perform or produce viable fertile offspring, right? We need to figure out how to stop that gene flow so that your offspring uh, are, are no longer viable and fertile if new species are going to. Okay, so a lot of this has to do with then reproductively isolating these species from one another. So this is the existence of biological barriers that impede two species from doing this, right? So this is some vocab words and then I'm gonna show you some examples of this. So reproductive isolation is going to be something that is in place um, and there's going to be prezygotic and postzygotic barriers with this uh, that are going to prevent these these two different species from making these babies. Okay. Uh, another important thing with reproductive isolation is the concept of hybrids, which is the offspring of different species. Okay, it's relatively uncommon because most of the time we're not able to produce viable offspring. But if we are able to produce offspring, we consider them a hybrid. Usually something is wrong with them. They're either infertile or they're very like sickly and they're going to die because they're the product of two different species interbreeding. Um, okay, so the two different ways that we can categorize these reproductive isolations are with pre and post zygotic barriers. So on the left hand side with the blue arrows, arrows we have pre zygotic barriers, and on the right hand side with the green arrows, we have post zygotic barriers. So let's first start with pre zygotic barriers. Okay, so with prezygotic barriers, we have five different types, habitat isolation, temporal isolation, behavioral, mechanical, and gametic isolation. Prezygotic, so let's break this word down. I try to do this with my students as much as possible so that you can do this for yourself on the AP exam. A zygote, which is what this is based off of, is a fertilized egg, okay? Um, a zygote is a fertilized egg. So prezygotic means this is coming before fertilization. You can see fertilization all the way over to your right. So all of these things are preventing offspring before fertilization would even occur. So this will make more sense then when I talk about these examples. So one example of a prezygotic barrier is habitat isolation. So in this example, you see a water snake and a land snake. They're very, very similar. They probably have a most recent common ancestor with one another, but they're incapable of mating because they live in different habitats. One lives in water and one lives on land, and that keeps them apart. Next one is temporal isolation. This is when the timing just isn't right. And this has to do with mating seasons. So different animals have different mating seasons. These two skunk-like creatures, uh, one mates in the fall and one mates in the spring. So they're only trying to get, get jiggy with it uh, in one time, and it's not at the same time as the other species. So therefore, they're not mating with one another. We call that temporal isolation. Next is behavioral isolation, one of my personal favorites because it all has to do with mating rituals. So if a bird cannot perform the right mating dance or right mating call, then it would not reproduce with a different species. Um, birds are incredibly, incredibly dependent on mating dances and mating calls. So this is a very common one in bird populations. Next is when things are actually attempting to mate, but something is going wrong and the egg is not being fertilized, and that is either mechanical isolation, which literally is just the parts don't fit. So with these two snails, you can see that their shells go in the opposite direction. One goes clockwise, one goes counterclockwise, and because of that, their reproductive parts cannot actually fit together in order to get reproduction to happen. 
And then gametic isolation is where the gametes don't fit. So the egg and sperm just don't fuse together. Um, so the process of an egg, actually a sperm fertilizing an egg, it's very technical and it involves like a chemical bond between the two. And if that chemical bond can't form, then fertilization won't occur. So all of these are examples of things that happen before, um, before a zygote is formed. Okay, it looks like Matthew has a question about a post-zygotic isolation. So let's explain that quick, and then Matthew, I'll make sure that I answer your question. So post-zygotic isolation can lead to new species being formed in three major ways. So post, again, this means after the zygote has formed. So in this case, these two different species, whoever they are, is capable of actually fertilizing an egg. And most of the time, that thing actually is born. But something happens after. Okay, after fertilization. So one option is that we have reduced hybrid viability. Okay, so this will lead to speciation because as these two maybe recent relatives or recent species partners um, mate, their offspring are not capable of surviving. Um, and I can show you an example. I'll try to pull one up really quick of an FRQ that I did, or some multiple choice questions that I did with my students that kind of showed this happening, where over time, um, as these two species were drifting further and further apart and truly becoming new species, um, the hybrid was viable, not viable um, and not fertile. So it was a mix of those first two things. Um, so hybrid fertility then, and then I'll explain how you can connect these to hybrid infertility uh, or reduced hybrid fertility is going to be when the offspring that's formed is just infertile. They're sterile and they're incapable of reproducing, so then they can't pass on their own genes to their own offspring, and therefore they are not their own, uh, you know, they're not the, the product of, of two of the same species. And the best example of this is the mule, which happens when a horse and donkey mate, uh, which doesn't really happen in nature, but can if you have the right farmer, uh, and then we form these mules. They're incapable of reproducing, but they're very beneficial to a farmer because they're strong and stubborn. Um, so, and when we see this happen to create new species, and I really want to pull up this diagram. Give me like half a second. I'm trying to think of which. I think I must have had it in my evolution path. Hmm. Where would that be so I can share it with you? It's a perfect graphic for this. I'm going to pull it up quick. Evolution. Thank you for your patience. Okay, here we go. I'm going to snip some images really quick so that you guys can see this. Actually, I think I can just share my screen with you. Even easier. Perfect, here we are. Okay, so this is a set of multiple choice questions. Um, but what you can see here is we have these two populations that are diverging from one another, right? And so we have a male and a female from these two different populations that are starting to diverge, starting to become their own separate species. And the hybrids that form, the interpopulation hybrids, at first are all fertile, okay? Uh, but in an intermediate stage, these two populations find each other. There's been more changes, right? Maybe these populations live in two slightly different habitats and they've been kind of evolving and going through natural selection in their own way. We have mating again, and this time uh, only the females are fertile, okay? Our males have lost their fertility. This happens sometimes because males are oftentimes heterogametic, meaning they have X's and Y's, which makes them more susceptible to infertility via this change in population or change in species. So over time, as these populations kind of diverge, uh, there we have now this issue of hybrid infertility, like with the mules. As more time passes and these two populations meet once more, now all of our individuals have lost their fertility, right? So any offspring is not going to be able to pass on their genes to the next generation. And then lastly, after a long time, after speciation is fully complete, uh, now we don't, don't have any viable offspring available when we meet these two individuals. Um, so that's kind of um, the transgression here of what would be happening from start to finish. So Matthew, hopefully that helps uh, with that. This is not an, a free response. This is a multiple choice uh, question that I think I got from a practice test. I forget where I stole this from, um, but this is a multiple choice question. A set of multiple choice questions. Okay. 
Matt, hopefully, or Matthew, hopefully that helped. Um, just kind of showing that this is what can happen with these post barriers. If an individual loses its fertility, then it's no longer considered fit. So what's changing, Anusha, between these different generations is the time. So it's just we're, we're gaining more time. So these are different individuals each time, just as um, the populations are becoming more and more distinct from one another. And that happens over time, especially if they're getting more and more geographically separated or anything like that. As we see that separation occur, our two populations will become less and less similar to one another and therefore less and less able to reproduce with one another. Okay, so it's just time. So you can see these are the initial populations where all is well and good. This is an intermediate state stage. So maybe like 20 years later, if that might be aggressive, five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, we're no longer able to, to create viable offspring. So it's just time that's changing. Okay, any other questions about that? This is all post-zygotic isolation, yes. Um, eventually, I suppose at the end, some prezygotic isolation may exist. Depends on what's actually uh, making there there be no more viable offspring between these two. But these are all post. Anything that has to do with fertility or um, the actual viability of the offspring, when fertilization can occur, that's post-zygotic, right? Because it's after fertilization, after the zygote. Okay, as opposed to the ones we were talking about in the beginning, where fertilization never occurs. Okay. Any other questions about that? Where are we? Okay, perfect. We're, on, we're probably gonna wrap it up shortly here. Let me just see what my next slide is. Ah, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll very quickly finish up with allopatric and sympatric speciation here. I'll just go through two more slides and then if you have any more questions, I can answer them. Um, otherwise, we can, we can pick back up um, tomorrow or not tomorrow, next week. I'm losing my mind. It's the middle of review season. Do you guys have the SAT next week? Or is that just an Illinois thing? It might just be an Illinois thing. You do, perfect. So we're in this like really special time right now uh, where we're preparing for this major, major SAT, right? And then also uh, the AP exam. So it's a really fun time for students and teachers alike. But very shortly here, the next time I talk to you, the SAT will be done and therefore we'll only have one major test to prepare for and you can focus a little bit more time. Okay, so last steps, okay? So in order to prevent gene flow, um, something needs to change, right? So here's a really cool example. And if you've ever watched the Bozeman video on speciation, he talks about this one, where we have an initial sample of flies that then have two different um, resources. Give me one second. Okay. Two different food sources. And this actually happens, there's a classic example of this with um, flies in apple trees too. So when individuals have different food sources, it actually changes or can change the way that they smell, the way that they behave, all sorts of crazy things. I guess it's like the, the mantra, you are what you eat. So in the top example, you can see these flies have a starch medium and they're gonna start to smell and act and be a certain way versus our maltose loving mediums at the bottom. This is why like, I could never be with someone, I guess, that doesn't love all of my favorite foods. But you can see that after several generations, they're gonna be slightly genetically different than their predecessors. They're actually no longer really capable of mating within one another. And so that's gonna be a reproductive barrier that's going to allow them to kind of propagate this starch medium uh, generation and this maltose, maltose medium generation and provide some sort of differences between the two populations. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry guys. I'm literally talking and you can't see the slides. <laughs> this is another classic example. Here we go. So the top are those starch flies that I was talking about and the bottom are those maltose flies that I, or flies that I was talking about. And after several generations of eating that certain sugar source, so that means they're using that sugar source in cellular respiration, they're breaking it down um, and uh, going to start to use those different sources of energy, they actually will prefer to mate with one another as opposed to between the maltose and starch group. All right, lastly, you should be familiar with the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation, okay? And the only difference here is whether or not a barrier exists between these two populations as they're dividing into new species. 
So as you can see on the left with allopatric speciation, that is the one that does have a barrier. It's because allopatric means different land or different country. So you can see that over time we have this barrier developing between these two um, subsets of fish. And it's always going to be easier to have speciation occur if there is some sort of geographic barrier. Because if you think about it, if our goal is to prevent gene flow, right? And Anusha, I see you asking that question, why would we want to prevent gene flow? It's not that we like want or don't want to prevent gene flow. It's just that you have to have gene flow prevented between those two populations in order to have speciation occur. So it's gonna be way easier for speciation to occur if there's a giant barrier between those populations because they're not gonna be mating with one another and therefore they're not gonna be sharing their genes anymore. So it's more likely that those two populations are gonna go through their own genetic evolution and therefore when they come back together, they're not gonna be capable of reproduction anymore. On the flip side, on the right uh, half with sympatric speciation, which means same land or same country, we don't have a geographic barrier. And so something else needs to be in place in order to prevent gene flow. So oftentimes this is where like habitat isolation or temporal isolation or something like that, where they're kind of maybe picking their own area within, um, within this general shared location, like sometimes I've seen examples where um, there's flies that prefer one tree versus another, and therefore they're only mating with flies on that tree, even though they're technically in the same area, um, or temporal isolation where they're mating at different times. Those kinds of things can prevent gene flow, but you have to work a little bit harder to prevent these species from mating if they're all bumping into each other all the time, right? It's way easier to say goodbye to some of, someone if you don't have to see them every day, right? your life lesson okay all right so we can jump back into this next week as well but any questions about generally allopatric versus sympatric so both examples of speciation one just occurs with the geographic barrier so it's going to be easier because it's easier to prevent gene flow that way and the other one occurs without a geographic barrier so it's going to be a little bit harder i can go through even some more examples i can throw some slides up if, if need be for next week any questions Cool, so next week, let's plan on, we can finish some of these slides. So I'll throw in a couple more about sympatric speciation. Um, and I actually do have a couple specific examples here now that I'm saying this. So that's perfect, that's where we'll pick back up. And then we'll talk a little bit more about polyploidy, um, adaptive radiation, phylogenetic trees. If anyone struggles with those, my students always hate them. So we can do some example phylogenetic trees. Lucky you though, the long free response last year was a phylogenetic tree. So the chances of you guys having to do one are pretty slim. So that's the good news, but we'll certainly go over them because you'll still have to analyze them in a multiple choice. If you guys don't have any questions, we'll wrap it up. We'll pick back up next week. Um, come with questions, please, please, please. If there's things in evolution that you're still not familiar with, let's get it done now, because then we'll move on to some other things, okay? As always, great to talk with all of you. I'll see you next Wednesday at the same time to talk about evolution as well as some cell stuff. Um, maybe we'll jump into cellular respiration and photosynthesis as well. All right, y'all. Have a great night.